Hey guys, and welcome to another episode of OJ Health Radio. Now, the guests I've got on today, I, actually, we go way back as, as we were talking about the other day, but is an amazing lady called Gemma Sandwell, I nearly said maiden name there. Um, Gemma Sandwell, who is doing some really great things with mindfulness. So, Gemma, thank you for joining us today. How's it going? Yeah, good. Thank you for having me here. It's great to, great to be here. Can you wave for us since we're on Zoom? We're having this discussion. <laughs> I'm a Zoom waver. Yeah, I'm a Zoom wavers. I don't know if you could be a Zoom hugger. I think that's the thing I miss most about. Yeah, like the, the virtual. Yeah, I think that's the thing. Is it like doing that? Yeah, yeah. Give yourself a hug and then you send it. <laughs> I'm not sure that I'm the same. <laughs> anyway, uh, how are things going with you over there? How's how has uh, life been in this crazy time at the moment with your business? been online and everything like that yeah it has been crazy times i'm not going to lie but mainly because i'm new house in the middle of lockdown so um had a couple of weeks without internet which is um which is always good fun but um yeah everything else has been really great actually um it's been a great time for people to learn mindfulness um because that's something i've always sort of taught online anyway so it's it's given people a chance to kind of hop on and and do that online and people being furloughed and things like that so yeah it has been weird times um i think the craziest time to ever leave house um but yeah, just definitely. about there now was, was there a lot of things in place to say you can hire stuff you can't hire stuff you can have movers or was mm. it okay in the end yeah we had to use some quite strong persuasion skills with a vampire company shall we say <laughs> turned up with Dettol wipes and anti-back spray and all sorts, so yeah, fun time. So it's obviously meant to be and it's meant to test you in a certain way, but yeah. tell us a little bit because we hear mindfulness thrown about a lot. We have to be mindful of this, we have to work on our mindset. What actually is mindfulness? So that's a great point because it is really used as a buzzword at the moment and um, there was a, a Guardian article about it um, last year which um, actually really sort of infuriated me and uh, I wrote a response um, to The Guardian. Because um, really, so mindfulness, the definition of mindfulness is um, paying attention in the present moment non-judgmentally. So on the surface level of that, when, and this is when The Guardian started to pick it apart, it's okay, well, if you're just in the present moment, um, that's not going to solve all of the world's problems. Um, but of course, it's not just it being in the present moment, it's being in the present moment non-judgmentally. And then it's also all of the other kind of teachings that come with the mindfulness and come from the kind of roots of mindfulness around kindfulness, self-care, compassion. Um, and in particular, that, self, that self-kindness can really help us kind of move forward into action. So it might be that we are paying attention in the present moment, and we become really aware. So you might be, you know, sit down and meditate and um, you might have a recurrent thought keep popping into your head. But you wouldn't say, OK, that's great. I've been mindful now and I've been aware of that thought. It would be, OK, well, what, do, what do I need to do with it? And um, what's that kind of kindful action step that I need to take? What's that kind of, sort of rooted in self-care step that I need to take for, um, for myself? So, um, so it's not just about being in the present moment. It's about that non-judgmental kind of kind action that comes with it as well. Hence why the Guardian article was kind of picking apart just being in the present moment and saying, yeah, because that's going to cool, that's going to create world peace by everyone being present. Um, but actually my response back to that was, well, actually it's not just about being present, it's what you then do with it and what, what that next step is as well. Um, so my background in terms of finding mindfulness came through positive psychology. Yep. So it's really about that kind of blend of those two things, the positive psychology, the kindness elements to it, you know, the happy chemicals in the brain um, that ultimately create that kind of kindful action step by using mindfulness. And I think it's definitely, as you say, non-judgmental. I know a lot of people that try to meditate and there's, there's some great apps out there at the moment as well, which help people with meditation. And there's a lot of frustration. I know when I started to meditate, not being able to meditate and I would get frustrated and then give up and different forms of meditation and it was being not judging myself for not doing that like I couldn't count to 10 without my mind drifting off elsewhere and some days now I can't 
And then some days you can just keep going and keep going before you know it, half an hour has passed. So it, it's definitely something which I feel a lot of people may get the wrong idea with, as we said from this article, which is mainstream media. Uh, we won't go down the mainstream media route, but uh, there's, there's a lot of things which people see and then they think they've got to do it this way, I've got to do it that way. So mindfulness is being present without judging yourself or judging other people, right? Yeah, it's, you make a really important point there around kind of the mind wandering yeah. because it is it is non-judgmental. So, you know, I've been practicing it for years and I still sometimes sit down and my mind is so busy and I might have to bring my attention back like a hundred times. Sometimes it feels like a thousand times, um, but sometimes that's just an awareness of like, okay, well, I'm a busy entrepreneur, so I'm going to have lots of things going on and therefore it's okay that my mind may wander off. But each time I bring it back, that's when those great changes are happening from a neuroscience point of view in the brain. So yeah, definitely not beating yourself up about the fact some days your mind might be busy. Sometimes you might find like real clarity and silence, but whatever, kind of whatever comes up, treating it with that non-judgment. Yeah, it's definitely, I've not heard it described like that, but that's a very good explanation. Like, that's kind of a gemma. That's probably a gemma take on. That's a gemma Yeah. <laughs> New thing. So we, we go, way back I think like 16 years old I think something like that 16 yeah. 17 like yeah we were 16 we met. high school and well, college basically what it was over yeah. here, sixth form. now I've seen you like change and grow into this amazing women like from afar when you've done your TED, TEDx talk and now with your business growing and we had a meeting a few years back I think of while you're in the, the corporate world how did you get into mindfulness just tell us what actually spurred you on to say that this is the route I want to take but like my life is going this way and I want to go this way. What actually made you do that and how did you do that? Mm -hmm. So as you said, I was in the corporate world and um, I'd studied psychology. So when we met, when we were at college, I was studying psychology then and I loved it, um, but it just didn't give me like the practical tools. So I wanted to kind of get out there and I wanted to help people with it, but it was just really kind of theory based. Um, and then in 2013, 2014-ish, um, I discovered positive psychology um, and studied that and that started to really give me the practical tools to um, sort of start to, to help people um, and mindfulness was part of that so I studied positive psychology in central London you know which for where I'm, in, I'm an actual introvert I'm a highly sensitive person and being in central London is really overwhelming for me but I found it one of the most incredible calming times in my life um, and it's because we started and ended every day with mindfulness practice. Um, and I just remember being in my hotel room afterwards, just crying, like, oh my God, this stuff is like, this is life changing. So that was kind of like my first window into mindfulness. And I was starting to find I was a lot calmer. Like my friends and family were saying like, you're a different person to be around. You're a much nicer person to be around. You're not this stress head anymore. They say um, before. <laughs> yeah, I was a stress head before. So um, so in my corporate, I've done various roles throughout the years. And in my corporate career, I had this real disconnect because um, I was working in IT. I was a release manager. So I was um, managing IT programs. And I had all this like skills and knowledge about the brain. But I didn't know how to combine the two. So positive psychology and mindfulness for me just kind of brought those two elements together. But what I didn't realise was I kind of went straight into the mode of oh my gosh, everyone needs to know this, my team needs to know this, you know, we're going to be an amazing high-performing team with all this stuff. But actually, at my core, I had a load of anxiety that I'd just not dealt with. Um, and I'd always kind of passed it off as, oh, everyone gets nervous before, you know, meetings and things like that. But it was so, so bad. I couldn't even, in a meeting with like 10 people um, at work, I couldn't even speak up at that meeting. I just had like complete imposter syndrome. I would actually physically shake with anxiety. Um, it was really, really bad. Um, so mindfulness kind of helped me to make friends with that a little bit and go, oh, hello, anxiety. Are we going to be here today? And that non-judgment element of, okay, it's okay. Like, you know, let's just, let's, you know, going to London with work was really, really stressful. Um, and I'd just be like, oh, hello, anxiety. You're going to come with me to London today? And then I'd be like, what do we need to do to almost like treat it like a friend? What do we need to do today to bring in that kind of kindness and self-care? You know, let's have a cup of tea on the train and, you know, leave London a bit early. 
so um so it really kind of unlocked for me that there was actually more going on with that and that that was okay and that I could talk about it um that then led me to becoming a mindfulness teacher because I was like I just want to teach this stuff um you know share my share my story in a way that really helps others um, so I went and trained with um, Shamash Aladina, who wrote Mindfulness for Dummies, um, amazing guy, um, became a mindfulness teacher. Um, and then that led me to, um, that led me to, in the corporate organisation I was working in, um, a couple of people had started to hear, I was doing some mindfulness training, and said, can you come and teach mindfulness to some staff? Fast forward two years, I'd done a tour of the UK, <laughs> visiting every regional office, training mindfulness for over a thousand people um, across the UK. Um, and in one of the sessions, this guy came up to me and said, I love your voice. Like, it sounds a bit creepy. I promise you it wasn't. <laughs> I love your voice. Is there any chance you could record me some meditations and I'll pay you? And I said, well, I can't really, I can't really do that. But I was thinking about setting, setting a business up. Um, and he was like, you definitely should set a business up because I would buy your meditations today. So that was 2017. Um, and so I went away, set up the happiness branch and um, kind of ran that on the side as a bit of a side hustle for, um, for two years. And um, then reduced my hours in the corporate world to part time. And I was training um, in mindfulness, I was doing mindfulness workshops, I was doing positive psychology workshops um, and strengths coaching as well um, in various organisations. Um, and yeah, then eventually I sort of took the leap and, uh, and went into business full time and sort of shared, shared all of me. That's not in my desk apart as I'm talking. <laughs> You get so excited, you're like, yeah, so I'm exciting that you just knock everything over. <laughs> yeah, there's that angry, angry Gemma coming out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you you essentially, I think we, we connected a few years back, we grabbed a coffee and you were telling me that they actually basically made this role for you. And then you were then about to go on that. So it's pretty exciting to see that it actually impacted over, a, well, it would have impacted more. Yeah. When, when I, um, I went to, there's a guy called Leon Logothetis and he's got a series called The Kindness Diaries and I met up with him uh, over in LA area. And I said, I want to impact a million people. And he said, well, you probably already have. You think every one person you've helped has got their family around them. You've impacted them. Say there's 10 people around them and they impact 10 people and so on. And if you think about that, like going down that like in a crazy like snowball effect of the impact your words and your work has had, which is massively powerful. And you've set up the happiness branch and it's not just you're going to go there and teach people how to meditate. What actually is it? What do you do with someone? If someone comes to you, what do they know they need help on or maybe not know they need help on what do you then do to give them that help so i work with um mainly highly sensitive um entrepreneurs and um i blend the tools of mindfulness coaching positive psychology um business and a little bit of spirituality to to help them as well so um I bring basically I bring together all of the tools that I have learned and I've shifted my own life um, you know from being that person in the in the meeting room not able to speak to 10 people to on stage doing my TEDx in front of thousands of people um, and running my business full-time so it's kind of bringing together all of those aspects of kind of neuroscience um, business spirituality um, to help highly sensitive entrepreneurs so we work through um, we work through kind of what's your unique style and what your strengths are. So strengths are a really important part of positive psychology. Um, you know, we can kind of tap into those happiness hormones every day, like a really practical level. Um, we look at your human design, which is just incredible. Um, bringing in kind of those mindfulness and happiness techniques every day, you know, thinking about your morning routine, um, what you might need to sort of build in. So you're, you're almost like preloading with those um, happiness hormones before you start your day. Um, and actually another important thing for kind of highly sensitives and, and empaths like myself is also that awareness that anxiety isn't necessarily always your anxiety. Um, so being highly sensitive, you can sometimes pick it up from, from others as well. So, you know, thinking about how we kind of clear some of that stuff out and maybe process some of our triggers 
um, to really kind of get that, you moving forward into that state. Is that when people, if their energy is low, your energy gets lower? Like we just absorb that energy off there, feeling depressed, if they're feeling low, we kind of take that on board? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there's some, I've noticed. Mm, and there's some research coming out now around, around the quantum physics of this as well, in that actually... Life. Yeah, in that actually we, we can impact, can't we, on on each other's emotional, physical states. So, so it really yeah. makes a difference being aware of those people we have closest to us, those people that we have around us, in order to make sure we're looking after ourselves. Because if we're trying to look after ourselves, I suppose, and, and people aren't looking after those, themselves, having them around us is going to be harder for us to essentially do that. Definitely. I actually had a little bit of a rant about this yesterday on a live, um, which was about personal responsibility. Oh, I saw them a couple of weeks ago. That, yeah. It triggered a few people. Did it for yours? I don't know. I don't know yet. It might have done. It actually might have done. But yeah, it's sort of like three layers of personal responsibility. So this might resonate with you as well. Like the, the personal responsibility for yourself around, okay, for your self care, for your health, for your well being. Mm -hmm. Personal responsibility for your clients. Because if you are not practicing what you preach, then you are not helping your clients. Um, you know, and this comes from like a place of like deep care for people because it's like they come first, therefore I put them first, not me. So you're not helping your clients. And then the third thing is like a global personal responsibility. Um, as we know, there's a lot of fear and stuff around at the moment. And the more we kind of feed and breed and breed into that fear, spring the right word, we, you know, we start to kind of um, escalate that fear um, so we've got like a global responsibility to actually shift ourselves into that elevated state because that's going to impact on a global level as well so it's not just a self-care is you know is a nice fluffy thing to do actually there's a real kind of responsibility that, that lays behind it. Yeah that's a, a powerful thing there and I think if we all took a bit more responsibility and I think awareness is going to be a big thing there because mm -hmm. you might think we're taking responsibility and especially, um, I know a lot of them working with entrepreneurs just like you do. I know a lot of people will put their clients first before them, but in order to do that, they're not then showing up as the best person they can be for their clients. So it's which came first, the chicken or the egg? How do we focus on doing that? How, how would you do that with someone that they're burning out, they haven't got the time, uh, they know they need help, but they just can't fit it in. How would you start speaking to that person? Because there's going to be a lot of people listening to this that know they need help and they know they need to reach out. How would you start working with someone? Because it's not going to... One, one of the things I get is that we haven't got time to work on our health. How do you counter that? Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is... Um, a lot of it I find is actually mindset. So you know, I'm, I'm an accredited coach and actually when we get into the coaching and, and we dig away at some of those stories that we tell ourselves around not having time, um, a lot of it is mindset. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of guilt around spending time on ourselves. So we would work on some of those limiting beliefs and blocks that were happening there um, to, to look at unlocking some of that stuff. But also we'd start really small. So, you know, if it was, um, so the minimum um, minimum time that meditation has been shown to work is six minutes. Um, it's, it's been shown with Marines, 12 minutes before the Marines go out in the field and they are incredibly focused. So, you know, six minutes or 12 minutes is not a huge amount of time out of the day. But even if, you know, I have had challenges, um, if I don't even have six minutes, so then it'd be like, okay, well, let's start really small. So what are the things that you do every day? You know, um, okay, I boil the kettle. And then what we start to uncover is, oh, well, I boil the kettle while I'm, while I'm looking, scrolling through Facebook. So it's like, okay, well, while the kettle's boiling, you're going to meditate for two minutes or even just take a few mindful breaths. It's just those really small, um, small habit building, really. I, and I, I heard a lovely thing about um, yoga. It said, if, if you feel like you haven't got time to do yoga, but you really want to create a habit for it, then roll out the yoga mat every night. So it's there every morning. And every morning, just commit to standing on. I'm sure that you, this is similar to some of the stuff you do with your clients, Holly. Just stand on the yoga mat for a minute. And you're just going to make that commitment. And the likelihood it is you're in your yoga clothes. Um, you know, you stand on the mat, the likelihood is you might not even do five minutes of yoga. Um, Sean Aker, he's one of my 
he's you know how people I have like celebrity crushes and stuff I have like positive psychologists people that I admire and um oh, mine's still Gemma Atkinson yeah <laughs> has been for like 15 years. nothing changes man <laughs> so um yeah Sean actually liked one of my tweets the other day and I was like oh my god <laughs> um so he uh he talked about how he put his remote control in the other room and he put his guitar on the sofa so that when he comes home it's easier for him to pick his guitar up and learn his guitar than it is to turn the tv on so it's like those little kind of incremental habit changes where we'll start to build them up but a lot of it is about mindset so there's some kind of stuff to, to clear the way first yeah that's, that's a powerful one so what would you say we've got meditation what would you say is a good morning routine that, that you know works for you because everyone's going to be different as we know what is a good morning routine that works for you that gets you I'm not going to say fired up, I think that's quite an American term, but it gets you ready for the day. Let's be British and be a bit... Yeah, depends what I've got on that day. Sometimes I'm like... <laughs> you like dancing <laughs> around. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's, it's really, it's the things I talk about in my TEDx. So it's the um, meditation, so even if you've got a few minutes, um, journaling, um, you've got exercise, you've got gratitude. Um, so sometimes I will combine journaling and gratitude. So if I start to journal and then I'm like, sometimes I'll write, I don't even know what I'm going to write today. Um, and if, if I'm particularly noticing that my, um, I'm feeling like a bit, mm, a bit tired, a bit low, then I will, I will make myself write a page of gratitude. Um, and this could be like, Sometimes it's, I'm really grateful for this cup of tea. I'm really grateful for the cat, you know, yeah. <laughs> it could be anything. They, do gratitude. They, they think it has to be a big thing, but it could be simply that I'm grateful for the fact that um, we were going to put this live on Facebook, but it didn't work. But I'm grateful to have the backup yeah. to be able to record it or yeah, exactly. those sorts of things. It can be something so small, like you said, a cup of tea, but then it spirals onto something else, right? Mm. Yeah, so important. And then the other one is, um, I think I've mentioned all five there. The other one is um, is acts of kindness. So, um, but this, but there's a slight warning with this one based on the personal responsibility thing. Um, in that, you know, kindness is fantastic and it works because it activates our mirror neurons. So when we do an act of kindness and we see um, the response of that person, we get like a double boost of happy hormones. Um, but it's really important, and I've seen it a lot. And I don't like this phrase in these times, um, but I've seen it a lot where people are just, you know, going out and doing these acts of kindness without actually really um, looking after their own self-care. And they're almost doing it as a distraction. So it's just really important that those acts of kindness come from a place where you're really nourished. Um, and this is a phrase which I'm sure I've stolen from someone else, which is imagine your cup is overflowing into your saucer so you can give that saucer to someone else. So rather than just your cup is full, your cup is actually overflowing. So you're in a really great place. Yeah, so you've, you've built your, your daily routine. What happens if you get thrown off? So this used to happen a lot when I used to um, go to London. So I used to be very conscious. I had an early train to catch. And it was a bit of a catch-22 situation because um, London used to really stress me out, make me very like highly sensitive and overwhelmed. Um, so what I had to learn to do is to be quite flexible. Like lots of my clients have got like children who will wake them up early in the morning and things like that. So sometimes I would have to get up a little bit earlier and that would be, that would be okay. And it would really depend on, okay, did I get to bed early? Did I actually get enough sleep? Like sleep would always be number one. Um, and then, okay, well, what can I do? So perhaps I will meditate for a bit on the train or perhaps I will, if I haven't had time to journal, then maybe I will listen to a funny podcast that's going to make me laugh on the train. So, you know, thinking about what I can do to, to boost those happy chemicals. Um, I would sometimes take some time and, and meditate in London. If I could find a quiet spot, then I would, you know, I would do that. Um, putting my headphones in and having, you know, having music on, obviously still having one out so I can hear to be safe for traffic and things like that. Um, yeah, just kind of being being a bit flexible, going with the going with the flow a bit, really. Um, I think it's been a lot easier um, from being in lockdown for people sort of being at home and able to have a bit more of that that morning routine. So I really hope that it does. You know, as things start to get whatever the new normal is, um, I'm knocking the equipment again. Um, <laughs> as things start to get a bit more back to normal, it would be great to see some of these habits um, continue. 
Oh, yeah, I think that's definitely something which a lot of people, I know, speaking to people that they've found things and even through lockdown, finding things you're grateful for. I know definitely at the start of lockdown, I was struggling because, as we spoke, the big, biggest part of my routine is doing my exercise at the gym. And then with the not being harsh on yourself is that I don't like working out at home. Mm-hmm. So I've done what I can and when I want to do it. I like doing my cycles and things like that, but not being harsh on yourself, but adjusting that routine. So knowing that when lockdown comes up again, but like eventually when it doesn't, for me, it's going to be more when the gyms open a bit more, is that fitting that back in with the new habits that were built up. So people are then going to have to go back to work and things and getting all that fit in. It's interesting you say about London with it being busy now. Um, we us both being introverts and you are INFJ as well. Yeah. yeah. So um, when I'm in New York, and I've been there a few times, I feel so chilled out because of how busy it is. And I don't, uh, London doesn't do it for me. I think it's because the streets are all over the place, but New York with the grid system, I'm just chilled. And I don't know why, if I'm on my own, I'm chilled. If I'm with someone, it's, it's harder to do it. But like, with everyone being so busy around me and I'm just walking around, do you find that the opposites have, a, have an impact on you at all when it comes to your psychology? Yeah, so it's interesting you say about New York because I felt that in New York as well. Really? Um, I mean, there were times where, and because of the time difference as well, like I struggled to sort of like stay awake in the evenings and things. Um, But I remember being in Macy's and I sneezed in Macy's. Everyone turned around and went, bless you. I was like, that would not happen in Harrods, (laughs) you know, or in any London shop. So I think, um, especially not at the moment, but... um, Definitely. Yeah. (laughs) I don't think it's like nice to you at the moment if you're sneezing especially <laughs> you didn't have your hand over your mouth neither yeah. yeah um so yeah i've definitely felt that in new york and um interestingly i wrote a post about this yesterday wow. um which is about being um being high sensation seeking highly sensitive people so we can have this kind of push pull um where we kind of you know we, we actually desire situations that have like high positive energy so it might be that you know no disrespect to London that perhaps New Yorkers have more have more optimism and, and they're generally experiencing more positive energy so we're more likely to absorb that positive energy and yes we're introverts so we need our recharge time um, but it might be that it's a different type of energy like you said a grid system perhaps maybe there's an energetic thing with that I don't know I'm sure there's an expert but that's somewhere um, but I do find in general working with um, you know, clients in the US, there is there is a more, um, we've got this kind of British stiff upper lip thing a bit sometimes, haven't we? So I think there is a cultural difference with that as well. Yeah, I find a lot more, like, there's, there's a lot of Brits obviously that are open with the development side, but Americans um, and Australians as well. Mm. And New Zealand, I'm not going to say just Australia, not New Zealand, because I've got a client in New Zealand. Yeah. I don't want her to be pissed off about it. But just more open to different methods and to asking for help and I don't know whether it's something to do with the, the health service we have access to over here. I don't know whether it's like because it's a free health service as such um, or a nationalised health service there rather than having to go through private. Who knows? I, I don't know what it is or whether it's just the way people are brought up. Who knows? Now, you've got your, as you said, happiness branch. What is coming up with regards to the business and um, any courses or anything like that? So I'm currently um, launching my new program, which is called the Shine Academy, which is bringing together like the last 13 years of my learning experience training, um, where we are going to focus on um, as intuitive entrepreneurs, what your unique strengths, what your human design is, and how we bring that into your business. So we start with sort of some techniques like the law of attraction and focusing on the fo- can't say the word focusing in on your big vision and dreams um and then moving through you know how to how to clear that energy process um process emotions um and how to basically how to run a business as a as an introvert a highly sensitive person um and an empath and we're going to bring in bring in mindfulness techniques um bring in some kindfulness you know the whole kind of there's a whole term kind of spiritually at the moment about turning fear into love well actually i've got the science behind why that's really important so we're going to kind of look at look at that and explore that and how we can create that as as a habit and we're going to look at 
Um, we're going to delve a little bit into marketing with this as well and look at kind of soul clients and messaging um, and how to be sort of really magnetic to, to clients, but really starting with that grounding of who am I, what's my unique strengths in design, um, how I then run my business as a highly sensitive person, um, you know, layering in those techniques, those habits, um, and then really soaring at the end, you know, you're ready to go, ready to, to be released into the world. And how do you do that? It's all online? Yeah, so it's an online program. Um, there's three options to, um, to take part. So um, there's a completely self-led option where you, you just flexibly work through the content at your own pace, but you're still part of the group. Um, so we've got a private community for you. Then there's the standard option, which um, you get to join um, a lovely group and we do group coaching sessions every other week. Um, and you get um, full box of support from me as well. So you pretty much get me in your back pocket as a, as a coach for that. And then we've got VIP. Um, and for the VIP option, um, you'll also get to work with me, me one-to-one -one every month, as well as the group coaching. Um, and just because I like to blend science and spiritual, um, the VIP um, option are all, also getting to Reiki sessions from a Reiki master. Because that's one of the things that's really helped me is this kind of understanding of science and spiritual and actually how it's kind of one of the same. So kind of releasing any blockages kind of energetically um, as well as working on your mindset as well. So you get all of that included. Sounds pretty amazing. Is it what, eight weeks, 10 weeks? How, how long it's actually it? four months. So oh, wow. you get to work with me for four months. So it's, yeah, it's really comprehensive. And how do people get in touch if they're interested in that? So you can reach me um, via, I'm, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Twitter. I don't use Twitter so often, so it be Facebook or Instagram are the best ones. Um, or you can reach me from my website, which is um, happinessbranch.com. Cool. What is, is it, what is your actual Instagram and Facebook? Facebook Instagram is, Instagram. yeah, wow. Instagram is at the happiness branch. Yeah, I'll, I'll pop it in the show notes. Now, you said something then, it's the last thing I'm going to ask you before we, we sign off with this about big visions yeah your big vision for happiness branch and where you want to be going and taking this so i just i absolutely love what i do i love teaching mindfulness i love coaching um so it's just it's helping um it's coaching and helping those kind of big visionaries i think just helping people to realize that they're not weird they're not alone and they don't have to they don't have to play to that introvert or highly sensitive kind of stereotype. They actually can achieve their dreams. You know, they can do a TEDx. They can stand on stage. Um, you know, there are no limitations. Um, the universe is limitless. Um, therefore, we can be limitless. So it's it's being in that place where I'm coaching, empowering, inspiring people to, to do that. Um, and giving back where I can as well. Like, you know, I'll have sponsored places on my um, on my retreats and on my programs as well. That's really important to me because, you know, to help, you know, people that are really motivated and, and inspired but don't always have the opportunity to, to do it. So that's my dream, my absolute dream, is to be, you know, coaching, group, one-to-one, -one, um, you know, helping those people to stand on stage and to share, speak their truth. Um, yeah, I could go on and stop now because it's, it's like a massive vision. <laughs> Seeing the change, you know, as I say, like we, we, we go way back with... Mm -hmm. Seeing us both grow um, with businesses and see, seeing you grow, this has been absolutely awesome and uh, building a good reputation for yourself. So I, I massively appreciate you coming on. Uh, guys, if, if you want to get in touch with Gemma, do so. Um, I highly recommend her stuff. I know it's always going to be awesome content she puts out and life-changing. You can see just from the actual testimonials on there, it's really impacted people's lives. So thank you for joining me. And, uh, Thanks so much for having me. I've really enjoyed it. I'm very grateful for you today, Ollie. You're, you're my gratitude for today. Thank you. Not a cup of tea for me. <laughs> yeah, you today. <laughs> good, good. Uh, I appreciate it. Well, we shall we shall speak soon. Thank you for listening, guys. Thank you so much.